Hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Rob Kirkland. I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, David uh, Milan. Was a firefighter trainer, officer medic with Hammond, Indiana Fire Department for 10 years. He moved into the hospital setting as a bioterrorism disaster preparedness coordinator working alongside Franciscan Alliance Hospital System for over six years. He has published and spoken internationally regarding disaster pre preparedness, PTSD, emergency management related issues, and terrorism preparedness. He received his PhD from Walden University in 2005 in community and public health and works as a lead faculty for emergency services management at Columbia Southern University. For CSU Global, uh, he is a program coordinator and uh, we are just uh, very honored to have you, David, here. Uh, uh, to speak on uh, risk management, a hospital incident incidents. So, uh, David, go ahead and uh, take it away. It's wonderful, and thank you for the introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate the opportunity being here this uh, this afternoon and being able to bring a topic to you that is is often hidden in the, the the bowels of the hospital, shall we say? We're looking at risk management issues today, and what I'd like to bring to light is that the various perspectives that a risk manager has to do during the course of his or her workday. And just kind of give you for the, the benefit of the beginners that might be looking out there for perhaps a, a risk management position or a risk manager position, or perhaps some of those who've been seasoned veterans might be able to get some of the things out of this presentation as well. So it's kind of a mixed blend of things, but I think you'll find it uh, quite interesting to see the, the various uh, hats that the risk manager has to wear during the course of his or her day. It's a, it's a good blend of uh, items. From personal experience, I had the opportunity of working alongside Franciscan Alliance and uh, St. Margaret Health specifically, and oversaw three facilities of, in, in dealing with risk management issues, and my title was uh, safety and security manager, but also bioterrorism disaster preparedness coordinator. That's a mouthful and it does not fit on your name tag, regardless of how hard you try. <laughs> so it was a, a good a good blend of safety and security, good dealings with uh, clinical engineering, engineering, structural structural damage, as well as a lot of issues dealing with, uh, with parking and uh, security officers and, and scheduling. So hopefully this will be a, a beneficial presentation to those of you who have this type of interest or just curious as to what a risk manager may go through during the course of a day. Next slide, please. There I am, looking young, young, dapper, and handsome once, uh, once again. You, you know all my uh, background and biography, but uh, I just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, I, I am the former uh, program coordinator for um, the healthcare management program as well as uh, healthcare administration. Back in the day, when it was just starting to be developed, we had I think three students that were interested at the time when I was developing the courses. And lo and behold, here we are with a, a nice uh, blend of students throughout uh, not only Colorado, but obviously we've now expanded to other states throughout uh, the United States as well. So I'm, I'm very pleased and very humbled that the program has, uh, has flourished and continues to do so with a lot of uh, legwork and background work from not only uh, yours truly, but from a lot of uh, talented people that, um, that have assisted me in, in the program as well. Next slide. So what is risk management and hospital risk management? Well, you're dealing with the applicability of uh, providing a safe work environment for personnel. Well, you're saying, wait a minute, uh, Dr. Milan, this needs to be for your patients and patient, uh, patient safety at all times. Well, in order to provide a safe working environment, one, the risk manager has to work alongside an executive team or a management team. And the risk manager also has to be able to provide a good working environment, not only for him or herself, but also the employees that he or she is working alongside. And then you have the personnel that are administering to the patients, such as your nursing personnel, your, uh, your aides, and as well as your uh, immediate managers. And then you have environmental personnel. Your environmental personnel are very imperative to the successful operations of any facility due to the fact they're dealing with biohazards. They're the ones that are cleaning the ED rooms after traumatic incidences and, and major, um, major uh, shootings, for, for example, or CPRs that are, that are involved. The, the amount of bio waste that, that is there, they are involved there too. 
needle sticks, slips, trips, falls, these are all in, inclusive inside there. So risk management covers a lot of things, not just the applicability to our patients that are there, a, also known as a key, AKA heads in beds that we need, but it does provide a good background for all personnel and all staff that are, that are involved. So in essence, it's the ability of management in general, not just one person, the risk manager, but a management in general and the executive team to work alongside one another, providing that safe work environment for personnel, for staff, for our patients and for, for our visitors. Our patients and staff are, are also known as customers and how you treat your customer is how that person is going to be remembering how they were at that specific moment when they're feeling so miserable that they're in it in there and how you care for that person. It all is cyclical. So keep that in mind as we go along. So in the hospital setting, we're able to identify hazardous situations that may arise, whether it's going to be um, some, some thefts that may occur within the hospital, which, which I've had experiences with, or if it's going to be with uh, some uh, trespassers that may, may be coming into the hospital, it might be something dealing with the, the door security or biometrics, whatever it may be. There's a lot of things going on during the course of the day that really make the risk manager have to be moving in a, in a positive direction and very tired when you go home, I might add. <laughs> But the risk manager will refer to as RM, and then we'll go through some of the, the daily activities throughout this, uh, this presentation. Next slide. So the risk manager. The risk manager is basically going to report to an executive team member. Normally, that executive team member is going to be the president of, of the hospital. However, in his or her absence, then it would be the... the um, uh, COO and being able to work alongside him or her too and meeting and saying, yes, we need uh, things to, to be updated here as far as our lighting system is concerned, so as far as our security cameras are concerned. Here's what we have coming up as far as uh, public health issues that we've seen in the hospital, marketing issues. It's all encompassed because the risk manager is kind of the liaison in between the executive team and the personnel and staff that are in the hospital, as well as disseminating that information into our patients and our visitors when they're coming along. So it's a lot of things that we have to think about during the course of a day. Normally, the risk manager is going to have a few personal personnel working alongside him or her. In my situation at uh, the hospital, I worked alongside my, my risk manager. We had two other people that were in our, our little division there, and we were included and in encompassing the security office. So we had the security office personnel, which totaled eventually 26 personnel, and then we had our own personnel within the hospital. Now, contracted personnel for the security, obviously, they're a little bit different. However, we did oversee and we did have to work alongside this, these contracted personnel to ensure the safety and integrity of our our patients and, and our employees, as well as making sure that they were abiding by their contract. Again, a lot of things going on. You know, it may be that you're required to oversee several campuses and facilities. And in our region here, in our Northwest Indiana region, we had five facilities. Well, these five facilities are spread out. Some of them are closer than others. Three of them are within a 10 mile radius. The other two are a little bit further. Some are 15 miles from our initial site and the other one is approximately an hour away uh, drive. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the risk manager is not probably going to be in one location at all the time. If you're going to be in multiple facilities and you're assigned to that, you may be director of, uh, or regional director of, these uh, five facilities, at which time you're jumping from place to place to place. It makes for a quite interesting because not only do you have to know your own base facility, but now you have to know the base facility that's five, uh, five miles away, and then the one that's an hour away, and then you have to become familiar with the camera systems, and you have to become familiar with the pharmaceuticals that are going on, the clinical engineering, the integrity of the building, the structures of things that are um, that are coming up in the in the near future. Are they building a, an emergency department in addition to what we already have? How long is it going to take? You're adding more and more, and I think you get the point in in doing so. Also, we're, we're looking at um, the HVAP standards, and I'll get into these a little bit later, and Board of Public Health standards that are met. A lot of times, these are, are going to be unannounced. So whatever meetings that you may have planned for that day or the next three days when the HVAP and the Board of Public Health decide to show up and look at your policies and procedures, 
everything is all stop. It's kind of like in the, in, uh, the movie Titanic when the, the, the captain said to all stop, that is exactly what happens. Everything stops, halts, policies and manuals are flying through the hallway corridors and such. You're walking from place to place and you're uh, walking alongside people that are specifically trained in dealing with that particular standard. So if, it, for example, in my situation with safety and security and emergency management, then I was walking alongside that person and saying, these are the types of card readers that we have. This is what we do for employees. This is the lighting system. This is the security system. The risk manager then will be probably looking over those policies with someone else who's more policy driven rather than walking the physical area. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Next slide. Some other daily activities are, are root causes. This is not something that we do in our springtime and summertime in our gardens. No, it's not the cause of dandelions. What we're looking at here is looking at what took place on a specific event. Was there something that we missed in this particular event? For example, if there was someone who had a, a slip in the hallway. Well, we found out that an IV bag broke and it caused the, the fluid to leak onto the floor. The person was walking, slipped, fell down, and dislocated his or her shoulder. How did this happen? How did this occur? Why didn't the, you know, the personnel make a report about this immediately, et cetera, et cetera. So these root causes are pretty, pretty involved. Daily activity as far as uh, uh, management and executive teams, the management team is one step below the executive team. So your management team, let's say we're going to have about 90 to 100 of us that are going to meet one time a month for approximately two hours and we're going to discuss things that are going on in the hospital, upcoming events, things we need to know, policy changes, etc., expectations. Executive team meetings, these are the leaders of your, your facility, your hospital. They are the ones that are going to be dictating your policies, going to be making decisions. Those are the ones that perhaps are going to be making rounds on the floors with nursing personnel and meeting and greeting patients, families, and, and staff. The risk manager is probably going to have to attend those meetings as well. Developing policies and procedures. These are very important because the risk manager has almost every right to deny or accept a lot of the policies and procedures that are done in the hospital in the, in the hospital setting. Safety and security are the main concerns, risk management, as well as dealing with some of the other safety issues in clinical engineering and, and stationary pumps and pharmaceuticals that are being administered the, the proper way. So they have a blend of people that are going to sit on committees that are going to assist the risk manager in developing these policies and they will explain to the risk manager this is what we do here's our procedures and this is how we normally go about it at the same time then these procedures are definitely going to be looked at and, and deciphered by the risk manager and the the staff such as, as my uh, my position was and asking questions and trying to figure out whether or not this would be applicable to uh, a daily activity once again, or is it outdated? And then presentations to staff and personnel, training, education, training, education, training, and education. I can't emphasize that enough. They need that on a, on a daily basis almost, but working lunches were, were very popular. We also had one hour training seminars. We did a, what I, re what I refer to as my, uh, my five minutes of fame at the, the um, management team meetings where I was uh, up there and said, these are the five bullet points that you need to know. Here's what we're going to cover. Here's how it's going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. Thank you very much. Pass it along back to top. <laughs> these are, that's how quickly it goes because there's an agenda going along. But in the, in the context of it, out of all seriousness, the risk manager does have to present some of the items, does have to give the, you know, the 30 second elevator speech in order to provide that information. Does it go quickly? Yes. Does it sink in? No, not at all times. That's why the risk manager and the team have to get together and make the effort of education, training, and then putting out the memorandums out there and also being able to make announcements periodically through, um, through emails. Next slide. Some of the further duties and responsibilities, we're looking at internal and external stakeholders. So you say, well, wait a minute, how can you work alongside someone that's outside the facility? Well, there, there are these other sister facilities that we did have, and we need to work alongside of um, these facilities because in the event that we have a disaster or an emergency, then these things are going to need to take place. We need another place for 
for behavioral health. We need another place for our cardiac patients, et cetera, et cetera. Internally, you're dealing with your, your management team, your executive staff, your, your staff, your personnel, your patients, and your, and your visitors. One of the areas that we often forget about is being able to design an emergency management plan. Probably not the most exciting thing that you would like to do, especially when you have many phone calls coming in during the course of a day, all the executive meetings, traveling to and from different facilities, et cetera, but they still have to be done for HVAP or JCO standards and the Board of Health. They all require that there's an emergency plan for the facility and how long it has it been updated and what's been changed. Training and education, I made mention of that. It has to be done within a, a, a proper setting. Let's face it, folks, everyone is busy in a hospital. Things happen in an instant. Some may be able to make it to training. Some, some patients may code in a uh, ICU or intensive care. And uh, things, things change where now we have to do you know, learning by computer-based training as opposed to face-to-face -to -face training. So you have to make it both applicable to people who like the, the computer-based training that might not have time but there are those still like, like the face-to-face -face and not the, you know, referring to as what I refer to as the distance ed when we had it in the, in the facility there. Next slide. Patient safety. We created a program for slips, trips, and falls and any types of pharmaceutical errors. So the head, head pharmacist, the vice president and myself, we used to walk around one time a month and we used to ask a series of questions in regards to were there any slips, trips, or falls? What about pharmaceutical errors? How can we improve this with the Pixis machine that we're dealing with here on the floor? How many errors have there been with the Pixis? Are there any scanning issues that are, are being done? Is this properly secured? Is the Pixis machine properly placed away or is it just left in a hallway? These are things that we reported back to the risk manager on our, on our findings on all the floors on all five campuses. So it was, it was a week's worth of work that we would have to do, literally spending that, but at the same time, we did minimize the amounts of all these issues that you see here. And then observation, as far as understanding patient and visitor satisfaction, as well as their safety within the confines of the hospital. If you look at how people perceive the hospital and listen, we used to sit in the lobby without our badges on just to listen and see what people were saying about the, about the hospital or talking about the place. And you would be amazed at what you would pick up and understand. And of course, right back upstairs to the risk manager, I would go <laughs> saying, Donna, we need to improve upon this. And these are some little areas that, that can help you along the way too. Being incognito, I guess, but the same thing applies to the people that are coming in there. You want the people to return in a, in a safe environment, in a kind environment. And us at the time being a um, nonprofit, and of course we were a Catholic facility, we were trying to you know, make sure that everyone was benefited by the services that we were providing there. But observation of people and their reactions were big clues as to the areas that went left room for opportunities for us. Next slide. The one area that is sometimes is left out is pastoral care and patient satisfaction scores. Now, what are you saying about pastoral care? How can that even be considered? Well, pastoral care works in a Catholic facility such as ours, worked alongside the, the patient, the family, and then eventually risk, risk management. And of course, you have your nursing personnel that are sprinkled throughout the, the process there. But they were asking about, you know, how does this impact uh, the facility? How did it impact your, your scores? Is this, is this interesting? Should we keep this? How was your stay? And once we obtained those scores, we were looking at them very carefully because now with the new ACA that's out there, still temporarily, we shall see, obviously, but federal funding was a big key to our survival and being able to identify with, with the public and dealing with our, our intake for our funds. A lot of our funding went away with the ACA, but there was a lot of funding that was coming in, but based on patient satisfaction scores, those were the areas that we were most concerned about. And then weekly rounds, not only based on the slips, trips, and falls and the pharmaceuticals, but the structural integrity of the building. Now you're saying, Dr. Mylan, okay, so it's a building and we're probably envisioning this building that's probably new and innovative and creative. Well, this building was built in 1910 and we're, we're looking back at, at 2000, uh, 2010. 
So you do the math and you can kind of figure out the, the implications of it. We're talking about literally brick and mortar falling apart in, in some areas. You're talking about um, very unsafe, dark alleys in, in a socioeconomically depressed area such as we, uh, we were in a lot of things, looking at the integrity of, of the piping and the, and the tubes and the plumbing and the, the engineering and the structural integrity of the, the generator plant that we had. A lot of things are, are involved in um, the integrity of, a, of the building on the outside. So the facade of the hospital is a very integral part of what's going on inside. If you're a patient in the bed and you happen to see a brick wall fall from your, your window, probably not going to like that very much, correct? <laughs> so we, we have to address those situations. And on occasion, you're looking at 90,000 to 150,000 for repairs on a, on a structure such as uh, that from, from 1910. So a lot of different areas to focus on, not only internally, but at, at the exterior uh, appearance as well. Next slide. The root causes, I touched on this a little bit, but let's delve in a little bit more. It's an investigative piece for the patient safety issues that are reoccurring there. So something that may have taken place uh, again now needs to be really looked at. So for example, I give amputating a wrong limb. We've had that on several occasions in um, different facilities, not only ours, but in the immediate area. We have five different hospitals, not only ours, but we have five other hospitals that were, were within an eight mile radius. And we've obviously were exchanging information and, and such, but it, the amputation of a wrong limb, how did this happen? Where did it go wrong? How, you know, was there a miscommunication obviously with the point A to point B and we all had to delve in and sometimes take weeks to figure out what exactly took place due to the gravity of the situation, due to other attorneys that were involved and our attorneys involved. And it's a, a complicated process with the root cause as severe as this one is, as far as amputations are concerned. Next slide, please. It's going to include several staffing personnel from the hospital. You're looking at your risk manager, your safety and security, your security manager, your nursing personnel, those nursing directors that are overseeing those nursing personnel, those that are involved in that specific situation. It might not be the nurse uh, right up front. It might be somebody from pharmacy. It might be one of the uh, environmental staff. Who knows? But it can go on for quite some time. It can go on for weeks, perhaps several months, depending on the type of situation. What I'm trying to get at is that it's not an end-all be-all one, one time for this to occur. It can happen for quite an exorbitant amount of time and it does take up a lot of time with the risk manager. Next slide. Other things that are in here, the final decision will definitely be rendered by the committee. And then the risk manager will eventually going to report to the executive team member and let him or her know what, to, what took place, the uh, moral and ethical uh, implications, the legalities that are involved in making this final decision, et cetera. So there's uh, a lot of times going back to the executive team member, it can be approved and it cannot be approved, but it definitely needs to be handled quickly and efficiently and in an administrative manner that's going to be professionally done. Next slide. Emergency management, something near and dear to my heart. The risk manager is going to serve on a committee. We had an emergency management committee or disaster planning committee as such. And we had people from behavioral health. We had pastoral care. We had risk management, safety and security, pharmacy, pharmacy. All these people were involved in, in the committee and the risk manager is serving as a member of the committee, as a designee. Also is going to assist in the designation of uh, emergency preparedness and response issues, as well as working alongside the emergency manager within the hospital for development of policies and procedures. Next slide. Eventually, this is going to be a creation of disaster and emergency preparedness response drills. These drills are going to occur one time a year with a uh, full-scale exercise, which is involving all people and personnel walking crazily around the hospital with the deer in the headlights look because they haven't dusted off the manual for so long. But at the same time, it's a liaison between executive team members, disaster planning uh, members, as well as the educational opportunities and the policy updates. These folks are going to be very, very important because one of the HVAP, JCO, and Board of Health requirements 
is to have a disaster drill. What did you do during that disaster drill? How's the communications? They want to see all these things throughout the, the years and year due to the fact that it's patient safety and patient care that is being compromised during a disaster. A tornado comes like in, much like in Joplin where it moves the, the hospital off the foundation uh, 50 to 100 feet. That's a, an issue that you need to take a new uh, grave consideration and try and be prepared for. Although the gravity of that is uh, extreme, these are the types of things we were looking at too. Next slide, please. Tabletop exercises, work and luncheons. I touched on those a little bit in the full scale exercise. Not only are you using internal stakeholders, but your external stakeholders. What I would like to refer to as the alphabet police, FD, PD, CIA, ATF, et cetera. We're all looking for police department, fire department, central intelligence and uh, federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation. Luckily we had a, um, federal building right across the street from our facility there and we had access to all these uh, stakeholders and representatives and we incorporated them into our disaster planning and disaster manuals as well as our exercises and in our after action reports all three of those organizations that I mentioned regarding the JCO, HVAP and Board of Public Health Standards were very impressed at the fact that we were able to coordinate these uh, uh, members into our planning as well as into our exercises based on their schedules. And then of course you have the management team presentation. Once you get this after action report, which culminates everything that you've done, then you have your five minutes of fame in the management team meeting to present this and say, this is what we found. These are areas for opportunities. And here's, here are the policies and procedures that are going to be impacted by this particular event that we, we trained on. Normally, just to give you an idea, normally the risk manager as well as the emergency manager for the hospital, they will be working on a full scale exercise for nine months. So that's nine months of meetings, phone calls, letters, smoke signals, whatever you need to get done. These are the areas that need to be addressed when you're planning for one of these full scale exercises. Next slide. Safety and security. Well, these working alongside, works alongside the manager of safety and security, such was the case with me. Finalizing proximity badges and biometrics for entrance into the facility. It depends on the type of area that you're working in. You had proximity badges where it just read the barcode. Others, you had biometrics where it's lasering your eye and taking a look at it, or you're, you're put, literally placing your fingerprint on the, uh, the touchpad and then you're entering that way. There's a lot of different things. And then you have your safety and security policies based on those biometrics, badges, and working alongside the uh, safety and security manager there. Next slide, please. Policy creation, these are just some of the policies that we came up with. One was the ER lockdown policy in the event that there was an active threat or active shooter. So no one could compromise the integrity of the emergency department, especially when you have gang violence, multiple um, homicides that are occurring at the same time, gunshot wounds, etc. These are the things that we had to come up with. The badge system. Sometimes ambulance personnel were given those badges, so this way they could enter into the ED doors. We had to lock down the ED doors eventually due to the fact that a lot of our area was, uh, was compromised and unprotected. And then we were also looking at hazardous materials. Being in a heavily industrialized area, we had to come up with a good hazardous materials policy, working alongside our hazardous materials officers from local um, county, as well as uh, our local fire department officials. And then one dealing with the press, you're like, Dr. Bynum, what does that have to do with anything? Well, when you have an incident, like any of those things that I've just mentioned above, they have the press that's going to be out there asking questions and they're going to ask a lot of questions. So you have to have a area for the press to sit. You need an area that's going to be accommodating, some that's going to be far away from the incident, far away from the president's office. So this way they don't go wandering around. So like is such the case that uh, we had at one instance, and eventually that's a, a learning situation in general. But dealing with the press in a, in a friendly and, and specific and designated manner will definitely be one of the policy areas you may wish to consider in your uh, facility as well. Next slide, please. Engineering. I talked about the integrity of the structure. Now we're looking at the use of camera for personnel safety. 
the personnel are walking across uh, parking lots. They are walking in, in dark areas. You have the late afternoon shifts in, in the wintertime. Obviously, it gets darker sooner. You have the midnight shifts that are coming in at 11 p.m. And then, uh, again, leaving it dark in the morning because the sun has, hasn't come up yet. So personnel safety is, is a key. Same with the, the proximity badges, biometrics, et cetera. We're working to hire security officers, both, both sworn from the local police department there and the security company, which I touched on. And then you're dealing with clinical engineering. And I'll give you an example of IV pumps where a lot of these were malfunctioning on our patients. And a lot of these things were compromised right from the get-go. So we initial, initialized a strategy where we're going to go walk around with a team of individuals and figure out what was going on. We watched the nursing procedures. We just had a few notes that we jotted down and we eventually found out that the IV pump itself was, was um, compromised. And thus we had to have a recall on those, uh, on those IV pumps. And what a mess. And I, no pun intended about the fluid that, that could leak out from them, but what a mess we had in returning them, demonstrating them, and trying to get new pumps that were sufficient enough to uh, care for our patients. Next, please. This is uh, one of the toughest areas where you don't want to think this, but it does happen. You're dealing with thefts within your own facility. There are people that are compromising other personnel and compromising the um, actual insides of the, the hospital. So we're looking at dealing with thefts. We're reprimanding those employees that are caught stealing. We're doing surveillance systems, not only with security, but with outside agencies that are, you know, plants, if you will, to see who's stealing from, from people. Harassment issues that are going on on the, on the floors, moral and ethical obligations that are, that are occurring between uh, employees and, and, and stealing, as well as uh, some of the moral and ethical obligations for end of life issues. First management, believe it or not, is involved in that. So there's a lot of things going on during the course of a day that sometimes uh, the, um, the normal day is totally out of, um, out of um, the area where you're ready to go and, and do your policy and procedure, and then you have to deal with the theft and then reprimands and other issues that may be compromised. Board of Health shows up and the day goes a, a different direction. Next slide, please. Accreditation standards. Well, Healthcare Facilities Accreditation Program, JCO, also Joint Commission Accreditation, Healthcare Organization, and then the Board of Public Health. I touched on these throughout. I'm not going to belabor the point with them, but these are the accreditation standards that may be in your, your facility there at the, at the hospital and, or, or clinic. They come in and they take a look and they look at your policies, your procedures, how things are done, how clean is the place, the integrity, the structure environmental issues both inside and outside of the facility, patient handling, patient care, what emergency management plans do you have in place in case of an emergency? Do you have a bad system? How does it work? People soft system, et cetera. And the Board of Public Health, state dependent now, I know the Board of Public Health could show up at any time regarding just a surprise inspection, or there may have been an issue at the hospital, and then they will be looking at an issue, but that will be an announced visit. It, de it just depends. But keep in mind that these are all agencies that are helping to provide rooms for opportunities and not to demean you, but just to say, hey, you know, we looked at this. Good job here. Here's a couple of areas that you need to kind of take a look at. We suggest this. It's a stressful time. Yes, it's three, three days of, of pain and anguish and a lot of, a lot of walking and being able to compromise on some things and then get some some documents to ensure that they are put together but it's well worthwhile because it impacts everyone that's inside that building next slide please documentation i touched on a little bit on the uh, hvap and jco and board of health but policies and procedures are all the main things that the risk manager will oversee. So all these manuals, all these things that may be in behavioral health, the risk manager still has an opportunity to take a look at them. You're going to be looking at patient safety, you're looking at the emergency preparedness, you're looking at the facility maintenance, and you're looking at the education. How many times have you educated your employees on slips, trips, and falls? What are you doing for that during the course of the year? Let me ask this person over here if they know where the uh, material safety data sheets are, are located. If they don't know, 
then those are some issues where HVAP, JCO, and Board of Health are going to kind of pinpoint and look at. Next slide, please. So some suggestions from uh, um, my personal areas as well as some of the observations that I had. Policy preparation has to be done months in advance. There's, there's no question about it. This is something that cannot be thrown together immediately and just sort of pass off and say, yes, we've, we've got that. The Board of Public Health will definitely have a, a field day on that because they can tell when a policy has been looked at intensively. Document, document, document. If it's not written, it is not, not said. That's all I can tell you. There's so many times that we say, well, we did this. Well, show me, where is this? How is this? How did you do that? If it's not written, it's not said. Document it as much as possible if you can. Then you have the creation of committees internally and externally, your external stakeholders with other hospitals, your police and fire, your alphabet police that are out there helping along. Internally, you're dealing with your management team, your personnel, your, your other staff from the person that's uh, cleaning the bedside all the way on up to the regional director. You all have to work together. That's all I, can, all I can say, and it works very well if you're all on the same page. And then safety and security policies, those revisions are continual. Just as you think you just made it through your manual, guess what? Something else happened the night before, and you have to revise, revise it again. It's an ongoing process. Next slide. Monthly meetings and the management team and the executive staff, both of these are, are going to be at different different points. Executive staff, much as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, they're going to be dictating kind of the policies and procedures. Management team is going to absorb those updates to the management team on certain policies that have been changed. Please note emergency policies have been changed here. Please note risk management policy in section five, it might be a paragraph, has been changed pass it out at the management team meeting and it has to go into the binder. So this way, Board of Health, HVAP, JCO, whenever they come, it's in there and it's noted as the changes. The committee involvement has to be all encompassing. Your nurses, your doctors, your medical personnel, your dietary people, behavioral health personnel. It's an all-inclusive thing and you would be amazed at how things work very well and how many things you learn as a risk manager and a safety manager about the facility because you took the time to include all these people and not have a surprise when your um, issue arises. Next slide, please. Moral and Ethics Committee. This was one committee I had an opportunity and a, a great pleasure of serving on because there were so many different things dealing with end of life issues, uh, decision-making processes that were done on, a, on scene, shall we say, with, with a patient or dealing with uh, our customer service and our, our approaches there. It just, it just depends. And a lot of those things were very, very heartfelt and, and thought uh, continually. We met one time a month, but as a representative there for that department, it was a, a beneficial experience. And we created our own little committee as, as such, making it a little bit easier to report to the main moral and ethics committee. A little bit of legwork, a little duplication, maybe so, but based on our outcomes and based on our experiences with all those organizations that came in and accredited us, we did very well. Also, directory for police and emergency department numbers, normally you're looking at within 10 miles, the ones that can do immediate, and then of course your long range planning. That's going to be helpful too. You need to have that. Keep your state and your governmental uh, phone numbers updated as much as possible. That again falls in risk management. And then the monthly walkthroughs with engineering. That's looking at the structural integrity of the building. Some of the areas that may be needing to be changed such as desktops or fire exits or um, nursing, nursing station designs and, and such. Uh, illumination with either lights or emergency lights, etc. Bulbs being burned out. All these little things are risk management. <laughs> they they have to be cared for. It's a a difficult task, but it's an interesting task because it's something different every day. Next slide, please. One full scale emergency exercise each year. That's basically what's what's entailed. You're also going to need to know that there's going to be policy changes and you're going to have your walkthroughs from these uh, these committees coming through and asking questions from all your personnel and then this little thing called a memorandum of understanding we were 
fortunate enough to have a memorandum of understanding with our local fire department, police department, the governmental facilities, our state facilities, in case that the hospital was incapacitated, much as we were in 2007 in August when our hospital flooded and we had to evacuate our 66 patients that we had, they all came because we had an agreement that this would be going on. We met with them one time per month. Again, a risk management thing saying, what if this happened? What if this occurred, if, et cetera? And it did. I guess, too, that um, knowing a lot of the, the gentlemen, because I had the opportunity of playing in an all-professional firefighter bagpipe band, and knowing all the police chiefs and the fire chiefs and at these ceremonies and things, one phone call does it all, as I refer to it. It's, it's comforting to know that these memorandums were able to be signed and, and delivered again, because you're out in the community doing so. So being behind your desk as a risk manager or a safety manager, it doesn't cut it. You have to get out there to do these things. Next slide, please. Then working alongside the IT department, they are your best friends, especially nowadays with technology being as such, if the system goes down, you need to work on it very quickly. Otherwise, you have personnel that are very upset that they can't get into the building. Doors are compromised. Computers are, are compromised. They're not encrypted the proper way with thumb drives, et, et cetera. A whole world. That's a whole presentation in itself. But it just work alongside your IT department. That will help you out. Human resources. Obviously, they're dealing with the hiring process, the exit process, but they also can help with the internal investigations, much as I mentioned with the thefts that were occurring that we had. They can pull out the files and, and demonstrate how many people may have been involved in this or how many times this person has been reprimanded. It's an immediate access to the personnel file and being able to see what took place in the past. It's a good historical account and HR can be your best friend when immediate action needs to be taken. Next slide, please. Delegation of authority. You can't do it all, folks. You just can't do it all. You can't be a, a one-person army and get through your day. You need to delegate your authority to your safety and security personnel, your managers, your, your secretaries, your other people that are working alongside you in encoding, et cetera, and help them. But give them a reward, too. I was, I was fortunate enough to work alongside a, a very talented um, person, and, and she, regardless of how hard it was, she made the time one time a month to give a little something. If it was just a pizza being sent to, to our department or if we went out for lunch uh, together and, and such, there was just something to say thank you. Meetings with the, your employees within the risk management area, imperative. This way you're a cohesive unit and you're able to delegate some of that authority that you, that you have, but at the same time you're looking at all these policies and being able to say, yeah, you know what, I spoke with the risk manager, she wants to do this. You're kind of like the messenger. And communication with other, other facilities, that has to be maintained. Whether it is a competing hospital or a competing clinic, you need to stay in, in touch with them because you never know when you're going to need them as far as suggestions are concerned for your specific area, as well as perhaps in, in the event of an emergency, like an evacuation such as we had, we had the communication and ability to work alongside them in getting our patients and staff decent, um, decent areas and accommodations. Next slide, please. With that, I know that's a uh, what I refer to as a down and dirty version of risk management. However, it is my sincere hope that you can pull some of these good things inside. Here's some of these nuggets of, of information and kind of disseminate those to, to your, your colleagues and friends. This is not the end all be all or all the solutions that you have out there regarding this type of risk management and security management, but based on literature, based on previous experiences and six and a half years at uh, one facility there. These are some of the things I'd like to pass along to you. And hopefully you can use them in a, in a positive manner and also create a positive social change wherever you are in a occupational health setting or just within the, the clinical or hospital setting. David, just one quick question for you. Sure. If we have someone who's interested in getting into this field, what recommendations would you give them as far as uh, courses they need to take or a career path in order to be able to become uh, what you do? I think there is a combination of things here. One, you have to be flexible because 
I initially started out as part time and just kind of filing things and looking at things and getting things organized and trying to find my way through the hospital and understand where I was where I was going. And eventually, once you are adept and show them what to what you can do, then it's it starts to to roll um, along. You have to make yourself noticeable. In in my situation here, I. I was literally working on a project with my my risk manager and she just happened to ask me, Dave, do you know of anybody that would be interested in working in, in the hospital? Well, I just received my post hole digger, better known as PhD. And I, I said, yeah, Don, I said, I'd, I'd like to do that. I'm in the middle of a transition right now. And I'd, I'd like to kind of, um, you know, kind of have that opportunity. It was an accident. <laughs> it was just an accident. But I was working from the fire department and working internally in the hospital regarding a disaster, an emergency response, and we were trying to coordinate plans and such. And that's how, that's how it came. So networking yourself, going out there and saying, hey, do you know of anybody that's you know, hiring in, in risk management? Or is there an opportunity to perhaps volunteer, which is a, a very good thing to do and get, get noticed? Because if you volunteer or do an internship, not only do you have an opportunity to know people there and they get to see what you can do, you have a better opportunity of looking at the job board and going into HR and seeing what's available for that specific area. It's a wealth of information and a, a good way of doing it. Class-wise, I would suggest that there's this wonderful university out there. It's called Colorado State University Global Campus. And you could take some great courses there as as well. And I would suggest that looking at, uh, you know, your your administration is is wonderful. But also remember to be grassroots because when it comes down to it, you're not going to be sitting behind the desk there all the time at the hospital. If you get involved, such as we were, you're going to be walking through, you know, 110 degree heat with your shirt and tie on and, and, and freezing cold for looking at cameras and such. So I would suggest being, being flexible, one, two, network yourself, three, ask, four, volunteer, and five, be able to utilize some of the courses, not, not only here, obviously, it's a, it's a wonderful um, opportunity here for both uh, bachelors and, and masters, but check around too with other emergency management courses and, and things that you might be interested in. Get a certificate in that to support yourself. This makes you a little bit more marketable. Time consuming, yes, but if this is what you want to do, the opportunities are out there and they will present themselves if you make yourself applicable to them. David, that's uh, great advice. And thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful, learned a lot. and. Uh, uh, we'll be posting this on the uh, faculty page as well as uh, making it available to students and faculty in the future. So thanks, thanks so much, David, for, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Rob. I greatly appreciate the opportunity.